Rise, happy Sunday. I am so glad you are joining us today. I got a few announcements for you to make you aware of. First, Rise Men, we are launching our men's groups last week. Tommy announced those. And tomorrow, the 19th, is the last day to sign up for the first round of these small groups that we're holding so that we can have our launch at the end of this month. You can go on the Church Center app under registrations or you can go on our website rise.cc slash men and you can sign up there. Secondly, on Mother's Day and Father's Day this year, we are having child dedications. Child dedications is a public acknowledgement. It's a step of gratitude to the Lord and saying that we are raising this child in a church under God's word to his glory and his goodness. It's a huge celebration. We want you to invite family and friends to be a part of that. We haven't done dedications for uh, quite a while with COVID. And so some of you guys have like 13 year olds, you're ready to dedicate, we're gonna have fun. Uh, but, but if you have a child that you have not dedicated publicly to the Lord, we wanna invite you to participate in that way. You can go to our website, rise.cc or the Church Center app and register for that. It's gonna be a great celebration we want you to be a part of. Lastly, we have made a shift to age based classrooms, which is exciting because now the content and the connection that the kids are having is more tied around their age and what their, their stage of learning. And with that in mind, we actually need more people to step up and serve in our Rise Kids Ministry. You can serve in check-in, you can serve in a kid's classroom, but this is a way of discipling and raising up the next generation of our church. And so here's my ask that if you have a kid in Rise Kids, would you, one of the parents, would you step up and say, hey, I'm willing to serve. Now, what's so great about ha having our service times is you can serve at one service and then stay and participate in the service at the next service time. And that way you're always connected, but this allows us to grow in that area. If you do not have kids in our ministry, guess what? This is still an incredible way for you to make an investment in discipling these children towards Jesus. We provide safe, fun, Jesus-centered environments, and we want you to participate. Grab your Bibles, open to the book of Daniel as we get ready for the God's word this week. Every time we turn around, it feels like the world keeps changing. The culture seems to be collapsing in on itself. And if we're honest with ourselves, not only do we feel unsure about where things are headed, we don't even feel sure about how we're supposed to respond now. Do we speak up? Do we play along? Do we engage? Do we withdraw? The truth is, none of this is new. For centuries, God has been calling, strengthening, and empowering his people for his purposes. Generations before us, Daniel was called to courageously stand as a beacon of hope and healing within a hurting and collapsing culture. You were not here by accident. You were not made to cower, to run, to hide. You were made for these times. Good to see you, 9 a.m. How are you guys doing this morning? Good, that sounds like a hearty 9 a.m. excited morning. Well, we are so excited to see you guys today. I just want to ask you guys, have you ever had like, somebody ask you a really good question? Just a really good question. Uh, a few weeks, months ago at Rise Young Adults, a young guy came up and he asked me what I now look at as a really good question. He said, look, I'm a new believer. I'm just trying to get my footing as a follower of Jesus. And I have these friends who don't know Jesus. I'm like, okay, what's up? He says, I want to bring them to church. But they said in order for them to come to church, I, they also want me to come to their thing. I'm like, so what's their thing, dude? Like, just do it. He's like, well, okay, so what they do is they get around really tight up against a fire at night. I'm like, yes. And they do like ancient native rituals where they're naked and they conjure up spirits from the dead. I was like, first of all, that is a phenomenal question because, man, what, what's going on there? As silly as it sounds to us, we're like, man, really, this is a dude who's new to Christ trying to reach his friends, right? He's literally looking at this and he has the confidence to ask a question like this theologically, biblically. And I'm like, that's awesome. But like I leaned into him, I was like, you probably shouldn't do that though, bro. Like, and we started talking about the demonic and like that we believe both in, you know, the spiritual realm and the physical realm and there's something evil here. 
Well, as the conversation goes on, it dawned on me that when we hear stories like this, we, we would consider this something like the extraordinary demonic, right? That there is demonic influence in an extraordinary sense. But what if I were to tell you that in the everyday culture we live in, there is an ordinary demonic influence? What if I were to tell you that actually under the surface, day to day, as we're living our lives, you actually see demonic influence on just the general culture? Some of you guys hear this and you're like, wait a second, do you really mean to tell me that like the devil is at work through like the culture and the media and just like pop culture and everything like that? I absolutely do. In fact, uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, if you are not a Christian, this is not like news to you. Uh, recently, Barna, a research group, actually did a study where they demonstrated this. They said this, that 51% of Americans uh, say they believe in God. 56% of Americans, on the other hand, say they believe in Satan. Now, lean into what this means. That means more people believe in personal evil, in spiritual evil under the surface, than even believe in God himself. Now, this isn't just like, well, it's a little percentage. No, this is on a certain trajectory. A similar study had been done in 2007 and 2011, and the research gave back drastically different views that essentially um, people have decreased in their belief in God and increased in their belief in Satan. What we're seeing then is that more and more the secular culture is looking at the way the world is going and saying there may not even be a God, but there is certainly a Satan at work here. And this flies in the face of kind of the, the generic view that we say, you know, uh, in terms of atheism, that nothing is under the surface. This flies in the face of like Richard Dawkins who argued that we live in a universe of blind physical forces that at bottom has no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, just blind, pitiless indifference. Right, the world is not as secular and as atheist as we think it is. Actually, deep down, people are starting to wonder, is there something evil afoot? And so we talk about these three categories, the world, the flesh, and the devil. These are uh, the enemies, theologically speaking, of the Christian's faith. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And you may have heard a lot about Satan. Like, oh, I know who the devil is. You may have heard a lot about the flesh, that is, our sinful nature. Yes, we know that we have this sinful nature, or we, at least we've heard Christians believe so. But very seldomly do you hear teaching on the world, the sinful culture, this idea that is all throughout the scriptures. C.S. Lewis was one of the most prolific and excellent, uh, you know, early 20th century Christian authors. And um, he talks about this in a book called Screwtape Letters, which is essentially a book about two demons corresponding to one another as they seek to lead a, a soul into hell. That's kind of the story. It's a very creative and interesting uh, story. And it's this senior demon writing to his nephew demon. And at one point he tells him that basically uh, one of the great triumphs of the demonic in recent modern church is that the church no longer preaches about the world. And because it doesn't preach about the world, people overlook it as a temptation. That preaching about the world is no longer in existence. Now, keep in mind that this is back in the 1940s that he's writing this. How much more is that true today? Well, the truth is that we actually do need to look at this. We do need to preach about this. Romans 12, 2 actually tells us as much. It says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so as we continue in our series, you were made for these times. We actually know we were made for the times of the culture, the evil, sinful culture that we live in. And we see that typified in chapter 5 in two men, Belteshazzar and Belshazzar. Belteshazzar is Daniel's given name in Babylon. And Belshazzar is a new king we see arise after Nebuchadnezzar. And these two men have similar names for a reason. The author is essentially trying to juxtapose them and say there are two options. There is Daniel and there's Belshazzar. There is the, the culture and the kingdom. There is this age and all that it has to offer. And there is the age to come in the Holy Spirit and in Christ. Which one are you going to choose? And so we're going to look at these three things. First, we're going to look at the culture. Then we're going to look at the kingdom. And lastly, we're going to look at the call. You guys ready? Yes, 9 a.m.? 
Woo! Good. Let's look at Daniel chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. It says this. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousands. Belshazzar, when he had tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, wood, and stone. Here we have a party that exemplifies the culture, or what we're calling the world, right? We, we have a party here that perfectly defines for us what the world, the sinful culture is. Now, I keep using this term world, and we're looking at the definition of it here. I want you to see that we're not just talking about the world generally, right? When the Bible talks about the world generally, meaning humanity, it's a mixed bag. Because in John 3.16, God so loved the world, yes? We're also not talking about the world in terms of the created order, just earth, right? Because God made the world, and in Genesis 1, it says that it is good. He made it good, so the creation is good. So what sense do I mean the world? Do we mean the world biblically? What we mean here, and this is a running definition, is kind of this third category presented to us in Scripture. It says this, it's the sinful world system that promotes and normalizes evil and decries and censors the good. This is the sinful world system. And here in this passage, in the first five verses, we get three external marks of the culture, of the world. And here is the first one. First, we see the world is marked by pride and power. It's marked by pride and power. Now, um, in this text, if you look into the historical setting in Daniel chapter 5, where we're at is sort of a different place than we were in Daniel chapter 4. We read of this leader, Belshazzar. Who is he? He's essentially the great, um, or excuse me, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar reigned for 43 years, and then 20 years later, there's different conspiracies and different people grasping at the throne, and now we have Belshazzar. Belshazzar and his father, Nebuchadnezzar, are ruling the kingdom. And here they are ruling, and there is so much confidence in the power of the kingdom of Babylon that um, you need to know this. There's actually an army outside the gates right now, here in this passage. The Persians and the Medes are outside of the gates, ready to wage war and to overthrow Babylon. And here he is, he's like, I am so confident th that these guys, our enemies, just like all the other enemies, are going to get clapped. We're not intimidated. We don't care, so let's throw a party. That's basically what's going on. It's pride and it's power. This is the mark of the world. In the same way, we experience this mark of the world today, don't we? This is expressed, this, this thirst for power, this lust in our own pride is something that we see often today. It's whenever we trust in, find identity in our performance. When we say, man, I have this many assets, I have this many investments. I have insurance. I have money in the bank. I, am, I have a high net worth. Therefore, I am not intimidated because I have confidence in me. It's whenever we depend upon the likes we get on social media to define our identity. When we're confident in ourselves or leaning into or even wish we had influence with other people. It's this leaning into pride and this trust in our own power. This is the world. The second mark we see here of the world is this external expression of greed and lust. What do we see here? This party is like the party of the century. Scholars say there's probably thousands of people here, right? There's lords, there's wives, there's concubines, the wine is flowing, there's gold and girls everywhere. That's this party, right? It's a mixture of like the Kardashians meets the Bachelor meets like a Super Bowl party, right? Like it's just the gnarliest thing you, you've ever been to. And here they are, and it's this party, and, and notice that he says there's both wives and concubines. First problem is he has multiple wives, right? And he's a king. And second problem is that he has concubines. What are those? Girlfriends, right? So this party is insane, and what's going on here is it's greed and it's lust off the hinges. And we're going, this guy has a harem. What is going on here? But the same sinful nature of the world exists today, because the truth is, that most American men in their pocket have 
a harem the size that would make Belshazzar jealous. That is, we see this experience of greed and pride, this chasing after money, this chasing after the next hit of lust in our day today, in the world's expression as we see it today. Thirdly, we see that the world is base and temporal. What they do here is they take the instruments of the temple. They take all this stuff, uh, not just from some obscure temple, but from the temple of God's people themselves, right? He goes there, he grabs all this stuff, and it's for the party. And says, this party has more to offer us than all that the God of the Bible does. So we're going to take his instruments, and we are just going to commit debauchery and defile them. Because we don't care. What he's saying is, there's actually nothing under the surface. Your God means nothing, there is nothing under the surface, and so we are going to live in light of that and party hard. That's what they're doing. And today we see the same expression. Every time uh, at the end of the year when we send seniors here out of Rise Youth to go off to college or wherever it is, oftentimes I'll see a few of them, and I'm just watching from social media or whatever, get derailed in their faith by some professor who gets in front of them and says, yeah, I know your church taught you this, but there actually is nothing under the surface, so live for yourself. You only live once. This, this narrative of our world exists today. It was there at the party, and it is here in our world. Now, here, here's the reality. What happens next is God shows up at the party. How many of you guys, like, know that feeling where some, like, somebody of authority or God himself, like, what would that be like if he showed up at your party, right? That would suck. I remember I was... Um, you know, in middle school, and I had snuck out with a friend, uh, and we were going to go hang out with a bunch of girls in downtown Gresham. We're like, <laughs> we're sneaking out. This is going to be awesome. And then I see this, like, Asian dude rolled up next to me and uh, looking at me. And I look over. I'm like, who is this? He goes, Nolan, is that you? And I'm like, wait a second. And that Asian man was my father. And I'm like, oh, dad, what, what's up? Like, hey, how's it going? He's like, you're not supposed to be here. And my dad had showed up to what? To break up the party, right? I was busted. And here they get busted as we continue on in verse 5. As we see, we move now kind of from the external expression of pride and all this greed of the world. And now we get to see when God shows up what's actually under the surface in the soul of the world. The, uh, let's look at verse 5. It says, immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. How creepy would that be? Just this hand shows up. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads the writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be third ruler in the kingdom then all the king's wise men came in but they came not re uh, they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation then king belshazzar was greatly alarmed and his color changed and his lords were perplexed see we got this external kind of like throbbing pulsating look at us we are the world external marks but now we see the internal corresponding marks at the, at the soul of this, of this worldly culture. Here's the first one we see. Fear and insecurity. Fear and insecurity. Uh, verse 6 tells us the king sees this writing on the walls. God shows up and starts writing something. And his knees knock. Some commentators actually take this as a euphemism for like he peed his pants, right? He sees what's going on and he's terrified to the point of he's just stricken with fear. And what's fascinating about this is they were so prideful, so confident in their own power. But when God shows up, we see that at bottom, they're actually deeply fearful and deeply insecure. Here's just an interesting point. That pride is often rooted in insecurity. That oftentimes when we flex, when we boast, when we, when we sort of puff ourselves up, it's out of a response of a deep-rooted insecurity. Insecurity is actually just a form of pride through time. That's what's going on, and that's what the world is like underneath. This week, um, we, live, we saw that we live in a world of fear. Um, there was a, a major executive, part of this uh, mainstream media corporation, and he was exposed, right? Basically what they do is they go in with these um, 
with these girls at a bar, and they, they start giving this guy a bunch of alcohol. Um, we've seen this a number of times. And when he's like 20 beers deep, they start asking him hard questions about his job. And so he starts to open up and say all this stuff. What he doesn't know is they have hidden cameras on them. And so he's sharing stuff, and he's talking about how we intentionally reframe the narrative so that the public would live in greater fear. And I quote, he says, fear sells. And you're like, what the heck? But also you're like, I kind of already know that, right? Because I watch the news. I know that this is all a bunch of clickbait. I know that there's some things that are true, but they're pushing it hard so that people might live in fear. And listen, today the world is marked by indescribable fear, isn't it? Today, specifically, people are afraid of the virus, right? Which, which is a real thing, but at the same time, we're living in light of this fear. On the other side, you have this fear of a vaccine. And so you got the fear of the virus, you got the fear of the vaccine, and now you have this kind of like third category. Like, I don't know if you've seen this, but people who are like, I live inside the house that I built in my house with my mask on, like social distancing from nobody because no one else is there. And I'm also researching anti-vac material, right? Like, and I'm like, wait a second, you can't be both like the far left and the far right. You got to pick a team here, bro. He's like afraid of everything, right? You guys know what I'm talking about. People, this is where we're at as a culture. We are living these reactive lives to the things that threaten us outside. And here's the problem with that. It's where, it, this is where the world is now saying, we control your life. We control the narrative. We control the story. And you must live in reaction to what we teach you. That's what's going on. And here's the problem with that as a Christian, as a kingdom person, not of this world, not of this culture, is the Christian doesn't ask the question in the morning, what is out to get me? The Christian asks, where is Jesus leading me? That's where we go as a culture. That's where we go as the church. We don't say, man, you guys get to shape the narrative. You guys get to compel us. We're not going to live these reactive lives like the world does. And so we see that the world lives in fear and insecurity. Secondly, we see that the world externally is marked by loneliness and emptiness, by being lonely and empty. We read this in verse 7, that he basically is like, yo, I'm going to give you guys a gold chain. I'm going to dress you in purple. I'm going to give you all these riches and all this wealth and all this power. What is he doing there? He's like, yo, I'm going to let you live the hip-hop lifestyle if you can interpret what's on that wall, right? He's like, you're going to have a gold chain like Bieber. What's up? You're going to have neck tats like, you know, Post Malone. Like, this is what's going down. You're going to be dripping. It's going to be awesome. So you better answer the question, right? And so you better give me the interpretation. And what is he doing there? Here's what he, you got to, like, look at the layer deeper here. He says, I am going to throw money at my problems. I'm going to keep throwing more of the things of this world at my problems. We saw that the external is what? Greed and lust. But deep down, what's going on there is he's throwing all these things that entice greed, that entice lust. Why? Because deep down, this world has nothing actual to offer. And we are suffering from a vacuum inside as worldly people. Loneliness and emptiness is the rule of this age. And so all he can do is throw, and here's the reality, just another hit of lust, just another financial increase, just another, just a little bit more, that will never ultimately satisfy, because what you're doing there is you are drinking from an empty cup, and no matter how many times you lift that thing to your lips, it will always leave you wanting more. Because there's nothing there that can actually satisfy. Um, John D. Rockefeller, one of the richest men who has ever lived, uh, early 20th century, right? He's in New York, and a reporter comes up to him and says, hey, how much more money will it take before you are content? And he looks back at, him, at this guy with a smile, and he says, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And that is the rule of this age. That is the rule of this culture, that deep down we are deeply empty because your soul thirsts for something that only Christ can satisfy. That's what's the problem with this world. And then thirdly here, we have that the world is externally marked by lostness and confu confusion. Or in other words, by being lost and confused. Verse 9 tells us that he is perplexed and he is alarmed. You see this confusion. He sees the writing on the wall, but he doesn't know what it means. He's like, what is this? I have no category for this. And here's the truth. People in this age, people of this culture, living without God and alone in this world, it's not just that they're morally evil and that we are morally evil. It's that we lack truth. 
We are lost. We are like a people walking around in a forest without a map and have no direction for our lives. And so the question now that's begged is, you see it in the stories, like what do we do at this point? Well, what he needs is the truth of the kingdom. He needs the truth of the kingdom, which is what we need as well. And so now we shift from looking at the culture to looking now at the marks of the kingdom. Look at verse 11. There is a man. Now, this is the queen mother who shows up, right? Uh, we read that the queen shows up, and the queen is not like his, you know, like his age. Like, this is his mom, right? This is Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, Belshazzar's mom. The queen mother, uh, much more wise, shows up, and she says this. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. I love that phrase. He's just like, he's something like he's from the gods. He's just got this wisdom from the gods found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers. Because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Now, Belshazzar. Now, let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. I love this. So here's this queen from this kingdom, from this culture, saying, I know a guy who knows God. I know a guy who knows God. And she has just enough craziness to think that he will actually respond and involve himself. Just for context, Daniel, this is uh, sort of pieced in here interestingly in the book of Daniel. But he's now, we saw him as a kid, but now he's like 80 years old in chapter 5. He is retired from his government job. Like, he's not involved anymore. This is Daniel. And so he is at this point in his life where he's chilling. He lives in Florida. Like, he's done. And, and here we have the queen mother who thinks, let's call him out of retirement, right? Let's actually do this. And I love that she has the audacity to do this. Already in this pagan woman, we see something of what the kingdom looks like. She knows that people from the kingdom will do the impossible. She demonstrates already that the kingdom is marked by courage and confidence. It's marked by courage and confidence. She has this kind of kingdom audacity to say, I'm not going to say no for him. I'm actually going to ask him. I believe that there could be something here and he might get involved with us. And I love when we think about this courage and confidence, this kingdom audacity, because that's what we need today. Christians today, we need kingdom confidence. We need kingdom audacity to say, listen, I know my neighbor doesn't believe in Jesus, but I have just enough crazy in me to think that God can move among them. I know that my neighborhood is lost, but I have just enough crazy that if I build relationships, God might actually use those relationships to reach those people. People that say, man, I'm leading a team here at Rise, or I'm starting a group, or I've never done this, or I'm serving in some capacity. And I know that that person is busy, but I see the kingdom written all over them. And I see so much kingdom potential that I'm just going to overcome myself and ask the big question, will you get involved? Will you lead that classroom? Will you join Rise Youth? Will you do this? And this is kingdom audacity. I'm so glad for kingdom audacity because when I was 16 years old, I was as lost as they come. Just this like worldly, you talk about worldly, like that's me, right? I'm just worldly, confident in myself. I don't care what anybody thinks. No Christians would ever approach me because they know he, he's not into that, right? And, and it wasn't until this girl named Nicole Call, who definitely had this like 20% crazy to think that Nolan Jaden might actually hang out with a bunch of Christians and go to church. And she asked me, and I don't know why, but I said yes. And ultimately, we went to Wall Street Pizza, hung out with a bunch of people. I ended up going to their church and months later was baptized in Jesus' name. And it changed my entire trajectory because someone had kingdom confidence. Someone had kingdom audacity. Years later, uh, as, as a 25-year-old, I remember coming, I was burnt out. I had just helped a church plant kind of reestablish itself down in Sacramento, California. And uh, my wife and I were like, we're kind of done with ministry. And when we get back involved, it's going to be for church planting up here. And I remember coming to Rise, it was like probably 100 people or less. And Jason finds out I was into church planning and sits me down and is like, listen, I want to ask you about would you be willing to help us start our youth group? Now, if you think about this, you're like, this guy's into church planting and wants to lead the thing. Would you help us start a youth ministry at a small startup church, right, at a church plant? What kind of audacity is that? And I looked at him and I said, no, like, 
I'm not doing it. Like, I'm not interested. I'm good. Like, it's all good. And, and he looks at me, and he says, no, I'm not letting this down. He's like, at least pray about it. Go home, at least pray about it. And I remember driving home, praying to God, and God spoke to me through my wife, which is usually how he speaks to me. <laughs> He's like, you need to do this. This is what God is calling you to do. I don't care what your ambitions are. Do this. And I'm a pastor here at Rise today because Jason had kingdom audacity. That's what the kingdom looks like. It's built in courage and in confidence, not in ourselves, but in King Jesus. Look at verse 17. We see this also in Daniel. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. He's like, yo, I'm 80. I do not need to be like dripping like it's good. Nevertheless, I will read the writing the king and to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, which is just ancestor, uh, there it's not his actual dad, kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness he gave him, all the people's nations and languages trembled before him. Whom he would, he killed. Whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up. Whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among, like even right here, if you remember, if you guys were here last week, this is what Jason talked about, right? King Nebuchadnezzar was proud and then God like turns him into a beast of the field and he's like eating grass and like multiple stomach. No, he didn't have that. But he's like, he's functioning like an animal at this point. And why? Because God was humbling him. He was working in his life by grace in an undeserved way. And when he finally turned his heart back to God and, and approached God, it was at that point that God reestablished him over the kingdom. And here's Daniel looking at this young guy and telling him this story. Now jump down to verse 22. And you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart. <laughs> Listen to that wor th those words there. And you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart. Though you knew this, but you lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. And you and your lords and wives and concubines have drunk from them and have praised the God of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, stone, which do not see or hear or know, but <clears throat> the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways, you have not honored. This 80-year-old guy steps up to this young guy who is the most powerful man in the kingdom. He's like, son, let me tell you something right now. <laughs> God worked in your grandpa's life mightily, and you've rejected God. What are you going to do about that? He has the bold confidence to rebuke. What does an 80-year-old guy, where does he get this confidence? Where does he get this confidence? Well, it comes from King Jesus. It comes from the Holy Spirit. It comes from the Father. Ultimately, it comes from the kingdom of God. One of courage and one of confidence. Proverbs 28.1 says this. The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Because when you believe in a sovereign God of the universe, you're not afraid of what man can do to you anymore. When you have confidence that all of your sins have been atoned for and you are perfectly loved in an undeserved way in Christ, you don't care what anyone else will say about you. You have kingdom confidence. And Daniel shows us that's what the kingdom's like. Number two, he has wisdom and knowledge. They called Daniel for this interpretation, right? They're like, Daniel, you need to come here because you're the one who knows God. They have to call upon him. Well, here's the truth. He has this wisdom to do all these practical things. Why? Well, because he reads the scriptures and knows the God of the Bible. Listen, we read the scriptures not just for Bible knowledge, but for wisdom, life application. The scriptures have the power to make us wise. That is the power of being part of God's kingdom. Is those who walk with Jesus and know the scriptures are transformed to be people who walk in wisdom. This is what Psalm 19.7 says. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. This is a mark of the kingdom, being, having wisdom and having knowledge. And then number three, we see this. That the kingdom is marked by depth and eternity. Listen, right now, Daniel sees this whole situation in a different light than everyone else. He sees the story from Nebuchadnezzar to, to his now grandson in light of who God is and what he's been doing in space-time history. That's the way he sees the world. 
And it's like he has this otherworldly insight, this otherworldly source. In um, August of 2003, New York City um, uh, had a total shutdown, power out. And it was this kind of interesting, I don't know if you've ever flown over New York City. I've actually gotten the privilege of flying over, New, and it's just brilliant. It is a sight to see. It's just a wonder of all this light everywhere. You can't even, uh, you can hardly imagine what it would look like if you've never seen it. And just imagine that day, totally black, totally dark. But there was one building in New York that stayed lit up out of everything else. And that was the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty was shining brightly while everything else was out. And you have to ask, why? Well, it turns out that at that time, the Statue of Liberty was connected to the power grid in New Jersey. See, it had a source from another location. And look, in the same way, when we walk through this world of darkness, we as people of the kingdom, the kingdom is marked by having eternal source, a depth outside of this world in God, in the king, in heaven. Philippians 3.20 says this, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not people of this world, but when we are kingdom citizens, we live with depth and eternity. Now, Daniel exemplifies all this. He's here to give the interpretation. And we see the contrast here, right? It's very stark. Between Belshazzar and this culture and the kingdom of God and what the kingdom of heaven looks like, right? It's pretty stark. And if you're here today and you're saying, dang, like my life kind of looks more like the culture than the kingdom. Dang, what does this mean for me? I'm outside of God's goodness. I'm outside of the wisdom. I'm outside of all this. And I've embraced all the greed. I've embraced all the lust. I've embraced all the pride. What does this mean for me? Here's what I want you to see. That this, this whole passage doesn't just hinge on the culture and the kingdom and now you're stuck. Ultimately, this passage offers an invitation. You are not restricted to one or the other. That you can actually traverse from the culture to the kingdom by grace. This is now, we've looked at the culture, we've looked at the kingdom. Let's conclude with the call. Look at verse 26. This is the call we see. <clears throat> this is the interpretation of the matter. Meaning, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Paris, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and Daniel was clothed in purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. And Darius, the Mede, received the kingdom being about 62 years old. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Belshazzar gives Daniel all this power, but ultimately the problem is Belshazzar doesn't actually repent. And what happens is his kingdom is overthrown and a new king is established over it. And this is a powerful moment because this, this moment actually po points forward to something else. At the end of the book of Daniel, we actually get prophecy, right? And what we see is that every kingdom one day will fall. Not just this kingdom, but every single one of them. And one day, we actually see at the end of the scriptures in the book of Revelation, that every kingdom on earth that will ever exist will fall and Jesus will descend and he will establish his kingdom forever. The fall of this kingdom points forward to the fall of every kingdom and the coming of a better kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus. And this is why it's an invitation. Because ultimately, we are invited into the kingdom of Jesus because Jesus is a king with a cross. Jesus doesn't just come down to shatter every kingdom, he does. But first he was shattered for us to be welcomed into the kingdom on that cross. You see, some of us are saying, my life is too broken to be part of this kingdom. I'm part of the culture and that's all there is for me. The truth is this, J.I. Packer says it best. Grace means God moving heaven and earth to save sinners who could not lift a finger to save themselves. That is the whole point of grace. That is the whole point of grace. Yes, our lives are broken. Yes, we represent this culture. But there's nobody in the kingdom who wasn't first part of the culture. That's the hope. That's the invitation. Recently, I heard of this art form called kintsugi. 
It's a Japanese art form. And they, have the, they basically take these pots, these vessels that shatter, and they piece them back together and fill the cracks with gold. And I love this art form as I look at it, because what happens is this broken thing is now put back together, but it's not just like neutral anymore. It's taken to a whole new level and is actually even more beautiful than what it once was. Listen, in the same way, that is what the cross is all about. That is what grace is all about. God is building his kingdom with broken vessels. Do you see the point here? That the cross where Jesus poured out his blood is where Jesus declared he wants to take the shattered, broken life that you have to offer and fill the cracks of your shattered life with the gold of his grace and build you into the kingdom of God. And so today we are going to answer the call, this invitation into the kingdom. If you are not a follower of Jesus today, or if you are a follower of Jesus today, every week we respond. And we're going to respond in a very distinct way today. We normally do communion, we do prayer, we do um, giving, all this stuff, and that'll all be available today. I want you to zoom in on one specific one. I don't know if you know this, but when you come to Rise and you see people raise their hands, do you know what that means? Is that just like emotional, emotionalism? I, I just feel so swept up like a rock concert, so I raise my hand. That's actually not ultimately what that is. Did you know that this is actually an ancient practice when one king would conquer another location and you as a citizen wanted to ensure that you were part and committing allegiance to that kingdom, you would raise your hand to that king saying, I surrender and I am now part of this new kingdom. And every time we raise our hands, we are committing allegiance to our king, Jesus. This is... This is what we're going to do today. So if you, would you guys actually stand right now in the room? This is what I want you to do. If you are a Christian and you have been saved by this grace and been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of, our, of God's beloved son, Jesus Christ, when the music starts, I want every single hand to raise to say, I commit allegiance to this king. Not out of emotion. You may never do this in your normal work, but listen, I'm saying today is the day to start doing this. To say, I commit allegiance to my king. The second group of people, maybe you're not a Christian and you came in here, I don't know Jesus, but I want to be part of the kingdom. Listen, today is the day to commit allegiance to Jesus by grace. He has saved you. And if you recognize that you want your broken life pieced together in his kingdom, raise a hand and say, I worship this King Jesus all throughout the music. And lastly, there's those of you who are saying, man, I did come in as a Christian, but I've been so full of greed and pride and anger and all this stuff. I don't know that I'm worthy of the kingdom. Let God fill the cracks of your broken life with the gold of his grace as you commit allegiance to our king. Amen. Let's do this as we sing. Father, we just lift up the name of Jesus, the precious name of Jesus. We pray that as the gold of your grace, so to speak, fills our shattered hearts, we recognize the unmerited, undeserved, beautiful, precious fills our lives, God. May we commit allegiance to that king and live for his kingdom. And all God's people said,